Coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline, countries race to evacuate diplomats from Sudan as intense fighting between rival factions plunges the country into chaos. Plus, Israel stops to honor fallen soldiers and victims of terror on Memorial Day and celebrates 75 years of independence. We take a look at the Jewish people's struggle for freedom, their dreams for the future, and the threats facing Israel today. All this and more on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Welcome to Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israel is stepping up as a potential peacemaker to end heavy fighting that has gripped Sudan for more than a week. A paramilitary group that helped overthrow dictator Omar al-Bashir is now fighting against the Sudanese army. The violence has killed hundreds and injured at least 3,700. Israel is offering to host the leaders of both sides for ceasefire talks and said it has already made very promising progress in the mediation efforts. Meanwhile, world powers are working to airlift diplomats out of Sudan, while millions of civilians face food and water shortages in the capital of Khartoum. The human rights group Hardwired Global told CBN's Christian World News the paramilitary group is attacking churches. Christians in Sudan fear that if the rebel military forces come to power, there'll be a return to the intense religious persecution they experience under Bashir's regime. Well, hours before Israel stopped to commence Memorial Day, a car ramming attack wounded five people in Jerusalem on Monday. We should warn you, the footage may be disturbing to some viewers. A Jerusalem Arab plowed his car into a crowd of people near the popular Mahane Yehuda market. An armed civilian shot and killed the driver. Police said an elderly man was fighting for his life in critical condition. The attack came just hours before sirens wailed across the country for Memorial Day. The solemn day honors fallen soldiers and victims of terror attacks. And according to Israel's defense ministry, 59 soldiers were killed during their military service since last Memorial Day. Another 86 disabled veterans died due to injuries sustained during their service, and 31 civilians were murdered in terror attacks. Well, streets of mourning will soon turn into streets of joy, as Israelis ring in Independence Day. While most of the world marks Independence Day on May 14, 1948, according to the Hebrew calendar, it begins Tuesday night. Seventy-five years ago, a declaration signed in a Tel Aviv art gallery changed the world forever. Against overwhelming odds, the fledgling state of Israel not only survived, but has grown beyond expectation. Let's look back at that moment and how it put a tiny nation on a path to become a world power. Here in Independence Hall on May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared the birth of the modern state of Israel. For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, the Jewish people had a nation. He chose the words, we hereby declare the establishment, it says here, of a Jewish state in the land of Israel to be known as the state of Israel. This was the birth of a Jewish state. As for all Jews, Ben-Gurion was standing here as the voice of 11 million Jews around the world who had no voice, who had no address, and nowhere to go to. Isaac Dror's mission here is to ensure the story of Israel's beginning remains alive and continues to spread. It was promised to us by God. We are the only people in the history of the world that live on the same land, speak in the same language and believe in the same God more than 3,000 years. From a biblical perspective, many see Israel fulfilling the prophecy in the book of Ezekiel, where the dry bones of the Jewish people come to life after 2,000 years of exile. Organizations like the Jewish Agency help lay the groundwork for that 2,000 years in the making Jewish state. The Jewish Agency was the lead organization in establishing and giving birth to the modern state of Israel. The whole purpose of establishing the Jewish Agency was to, on the one hand, unite the global Jewish people and to bring the global Jewish people in front of the British mandate to be the organization that would lead and establish a national home for the Jewish people in the land of Israel. To fully comprehend the miracle of the country's birth, consider that it happened in the shadow of the Holocaust, or Shoah in Hebrew, when the world learned how Nazi Germany murdered six million Jews. When you 
understand uh, that only three years after the end of the Shoah, the lowest point the Jewish people reached in its exile, we started our redemption process and we regained our independence after 2,000 years of terrible events. Well, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what a miracle is. Even so, Dayan dispels one myth about the connection between Israel's beginning and the Holocaust. Israel was not established because of the Holocaust. Israel was established in spite of the Holocaust. Israel would have been a much robust, greater, secure, successful country if there were additional six million Jews and their descendants in the world. But Israel is the guarantee that there will be no other Shoah for the Jewish people. Now, after 75 years, Israel maintains its safety and security with one of the most powerful militaries in the world. Then it was small units of very patriotic uh, people, some of them Holocaust survivors who just came off the boat from Europe, put on IDF uniforms and joined battle and defended Israel in 1948 against six Arab armies. Today, we are a highly organized, developed, and well-funded military, uh, perhaps the strongest in the region, that enjoys a significant technological advantage over all of our enemies. Israel is also an economic miracle. This tiny country with less than 10 million people has the highest concentration of new businesses per capita in the world, earning it the nickname of Startup Nation. John Medved, founder of Our Crowd, a venture capital investment company, showcases these accomplishments at his annual investor summit. This is what Israel is supposed to be doing, right? If Israel wasn't the startup nation, so what are we going to be? Okay, I'm sorry, this is our destiny. Our destiny is to create. Our destiny is to, you know, fix the world. And we're just a little people, we make a lot of noise. But I think that most Israelis, whether they wear a yarmulke or they don't wear a yarmulke, view this as a spiritual undertaking, that we're doing this not just to make money, but to do good. Yet throughout its history, Israel has faced nearly insurmountable odds. Just hours after Ben-Gurion declared the state, six Arab nations tried to drive it into the sea. While it survived, Israel would be challenged again in the 1967 Six-Day War and the 1973 Yom Kippur War. After thousands of years in exile and 75 years as a country, Israel stands, despite enemies within, along each border and beyond. It's a modern miracle. The rebirth of the Jewish state against all odds, a, a people that were left for dead, that had been dispersed to the four corners of, of the earth, and you saw the ancient prophecies uh, fulfilled, where you had the ingathering of the Jewish exiles, the restoration of Jewish sovereignty in modern times, against all odds. Former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. and now Strategic Affairs Minister Ron Dermer tells CBN News this miracle can be seen unfolding throughout the nation. And you're seeing that happen wherever you go in Israel, whether it's in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and you saw the, all the ancient history, and then you see the startup nation. You go north, south, east, and west. Israel is a modern miracle. It is the greatest miracle of the 20th century and maybe the greatest miracle of the last 2,000 years. Coming up, Jerusalem Post columnist Gil Troy calls for moral clarity on the causes for terror attacks in Israel. Terrorists have launched a number of violent attacks on Israeli Jews these last few weeks. Some in the global community have responded with justifications and victim-blaming rhetoric. Our Jerusalem correspondent Paul Strand spoke with one Israeli commentator who takes issue with any justification of violence. Take a look. We're speaking with commentator Gil Troy, who's recently written a Jerusalem Post op-ed called Israelis Must Remain United in the Face of Terrorism. Gil, you wanted to put your finger right on the question of who's to blame for the long, long onslaught of terror attacks in Israel. Who is to blame? We always like to create narratives, but we have to be very, very clear. Israeli actions aren't the cause of terrorism. Terrorists are the, car, are the cause of terrorism. And we need that moral clarity. And we sometimes try to give some kind of excuse for, oh, they're reacting to this, they're reacting to that. To kill a human being, to ram 
two children who are sitting there standing for their, with their father waiting for a bus to kill a woman and her two daughters at, at close range requires years of manipulation and of delegitimization and of hatred. It doesn't come just because Israel did this or that. They hate Israel because what Israel is, not because of what Israel does. Well, yeah, I was going to say some in Israel suggest, some inside Israel and many outside suggest that uh, Israelis are to blame. And, and what do you say to that accusation? I call these people the blame Israel firsters, that they don't see how deep the hatred goes. They don't see how often Israel has tried to make peace. And they also don't see how evil terrorism is. We know this. We know this as Americans. We know this as Westerners. We know this as many of us have been victimized by terrorism. And we don't, if we don't have moral clarity by implying that somehow there's a justification, we help feed the terrorism and we justify the terrorism and it's unacceptable. You terrorists recently gunned down, you mentioned this, a mother and her two daughters, uh, the, the British Israeli D family. Uh, tell us how anti-Zionists are actually blaming the mom and daughters for their own murders. The D family was going on vacation in a two-car convoy because they were a family of seven. And they were ambushed by a crazed Palestinian terrorist, hopped up on who knows what, on hatred, and they're saying, oh, well, they're settlers because they live past the Green Line. Now, the Green Line was an imp improvised border from the 1949 Armistice Agreement. That terrorist didn't know where, where those people lived. And where did they live? They were innocents who were on their way to vacation to somehow have these tweets, to somehow have these justifications by intellectuals saying, oh, well, they're combatants, is really to blur the morality and, in, in, in a sense, to kind of justify terrorism in the most awful way. How did Rabbi Leo D. answer these charges that his, that his wife and his two daughters were complicit in their own murders? On the worst day of his life, this rabbi stood up and first of all, had a clear line about moral clarity. He said, we cannot live in a world of relativism. We cannot live in a world where we can't distinguish between good and bad. We can't live in a world where we blame the victim. But then he said something really powerful. He said, what's true faith? Faith is not just counting what you've lost, but appreciating what you have. And he said, I used to have a family of seven. Now I have a family of four. And we know that Israel's been a little divided lately. We've had our political challenges. But that man and his beautiful remaining children and the pain that we all felt united us. And he showed that there's a way forward, even on the worst day of his life. Do you see in how he reacted to these terrorists important clues to how Israelis have survived, even thrived, despite 75 years of horrifying assaults on, on them and on their nation? Israel has never known a formal day of peace, but Israel has also never known a day where it didn't have a democracy, quite unique. And yes, we are, I call this the jujitsu, J-E-W. Take the negative and turn it into a positive. Don't let them define us. Don't let them freeze us in our most painful moment. Don't let them freeze us in the worst day of our lives. But pull out of that and make sure to have the best day of our lives. And it was very, very powerful because the murder of his wife and two daughters occurred during the festival of Passover. And the rabbi had to do what they call the hardest mitzvah, the hardest commandment. Still celebrate the holiday? and then mourn. And that dance between mourning and celebration is what we're all going to experience during Memorial Day in Israel, which is a very serious day. It's not a day for sales. It's a day for mourning. And then at a, a moment's instant, there's going to be a siren. We'll stand at attention. We'll put mourning aside, and we'll celebrate the 75th anniversary of the State of Israel. Well, thank you so much, Gil Troy, author of the recent Jerusalem Post commentary, Israelis Must Remain United in the Face of Terrorism. I'm Paul Strand, CBN News, Jerusalem. Up next, photographs taken more than 100 years ago tell the story of Israel's history before its rebirth in 1948 and remind a new generation of their cultural roots. Long before digital cameras, cell phones, and computers, one Jewish organization not only helped develop Israel, it documented the land's history in pictures. CBN News Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl takes a look back at this special effort to chronicle the Jewish state's story. This may look like a storage room full of old files, although in reality it's a treasure trove providing a pictorial history of Israel. We're at the heart of the archive, at the photo archive. This is the place where we can find printed photographs taken from early 20th century and all the way till the end of the printed material era. 
Decades before the Jewish state's birth, Karen Kayemet Lee Israel, Jewish National Fund, or KKLJNF, was breaking ground. KKLJNF is an organization that was established 120 years ago, aimed at buying, purchasing land in Eretz Israel, right here in Israel, and also developing it, which means preparing the land after purchasing it for housing, building new communities, helping people get here so they can fully establish and inhabit these homes. Ifrat Sinai, head of KKL JNF Photo Archive, says cameras have continued snapping history since the beginning. KKL JNF used to send photographers to different corners all over Israel so they can capture what is going on, the places that are being built and established, the faces of the pioneers, all that spirit of creating something new. And that's what created uh, this unique and very important uh, collection. One of Sinai's favorites is this unique pose of David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister. This is not something that we're used to seeing him with, <laughs> with cool sunglasses. There's another picture, which I really like. David Ben-Gurion, on the day of the Declaration of Independence, while he's still working out the draft of that declaration. And a year later, on Israel's first birthday... These are photographs from the very first year of the celebration in 1949. As you can see, bringing the Torah books. And what I wanted to show you was the military parades that were taking place in the big cities. We can see how everyone used to go out to the balconies and watch the parade. And you can also see the streets, the familiar streets of Jerusalem. This is King George Street, for example, taken in 1950. And capturing Independence Day celebrations, picnics, and barbecues that go back decades. In addition to acquiring land, KKL JNF prepared it for housing, built reservoirs, rehabbed rivers, and is probably best known for planting trees. Here we have photographs taken in Martyrs Forest. This is a forest that was planted in the early 1950s. It has six million trees planted in to commemorate the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. According to Sinai, it's estimated there were around 14,000 trees here when the Ottoman Turkish Empire ended more than 100 years ago. Starting 1908, we started trying to plant trees here. And nowadays we're talking about over 240 million trees planted all over Israel. There's also historic Jerusalem, overlooking the city from the Mount of Olives, the distribution of pasteurized milk to babies, the railway station from 1927, and the Western Wall in 1941, as well as photographs of Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. Pioneers building agricultural communities called kibbutzim and moshavim, and glass plate negatives used before the gelatin kind. So this was taken in 1924, and this is Tel Aviv. You can see the sand. So it really is a city that rose from the sands. Throughout each year, KKL JNF shares its historic highlights at exhibitions like this one in Jerusalem. We're displaying photographs two and a half meters wide, historical photographs of Jerusalem that were colorized. The KKL JNF says many times when we look at black and white photos, we tend to think the past was lived without color. But what they've done in this exhibit, they've used an innovative colorization technology, along with research into the fashion and culture of the time to put color in the photos and breathe new life into history. An exhibition also took place recently at the International Expo in Dubai. Many of the photos are now digitized, and the archive can be viewed online in Hebrew and soon will be available in English. It currently has more than a million photos, and like the state of Israel itself, is still growing. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Up next, an award-winning political cartoonist, Yaakov Kirshen, gives a hat tip to the prophet Ezekiel in his work depicting life in modern Israel. Thank you for watching Jerusalem Dayline. We're committed to providing you with unbiased reporting from the Holy Land. Through weekly broadcasts, podcasts, and online media, our vision is to reach millions around the globe with the true story of what's happening in Israel and the Middle East, all from a biblical and prophetic perspective. This is a big vision and is only made possible 
by the generous support of people like you. Call us toll free at 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash Jerusalem Dateline and make a donation that will help spread the light of truth about Israel throughout the world. Dry Bones is one of the most well-known cartoons in the world. It's read by millions, and the creative genius behind the cartoon, Yaakov Kirshen, explains how he came up with the unusual name for his work. When I came to Israel and decided I would start doing a cartoon, I thought, well, I needed a name, like Kirshen's Corner with corner spelt with a K. And I kept thinking, what should it be? And then I realized that one of the things that had brought me to Israel was my reading of the book of Ezekiel. And in the book of Ezekiel, this guy Ezekiel, who lived 2,600 years ago, saw a vision of what to him was the far future. And that was of a time when it looked like the world had destroyed the Jewish people. But at that point, we would come out of our graves and the image he saw was of a valley filled with dry bones. And these bones came together, like the knee bone connected to the shin bone and all like that. And in that imagery, he saw the rebuilding of the Jewish state. He saw the coming together and the ingathering of the Jewish people. He saw the the rebuilding of the cities and the planting of the trees. And therefore, if I was going to do a cartoon about what was happening today, all I could do would be to add to what he had seen incredibly 2,600 years ago. And so I decided to call it Dry Bones, thinking that everyone would understand. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blast so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.